On this episode of What the Ship, we go around the horn covering all the major maritime sectors. Tankers, bulkers, container ships, passenger liners, and then we finally end up fully aground. Welcome to this episode. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. So a lot going on. We're going to cover all sectors in the maritime news. But before we get going, a couple of quick updates. Still investigating and waiting to get word about the Ever Forward, the ship that went aground off Baltimore earlier this year. Put in a FOIA, Freedom of Information request. Have not heard anything back yet. Lots of rumors about pilot error and human error being the cause of this, but nothing definitive yet keep you posted on that apl vanda has finally proceeded on and is offloading her cargo has offloaded her cargo so for a month that ship sat in djibouti with very little information coming from cma cgm about the plight of the vessel and then finally this week i got a chance to guest host on the bilge pumps podcast if you don't follow bilge pumps they're great three guys talking about naval and maritime news. I, I'm always excited to be on the Bilge Pumps with them, but I got to host it and talk to the three hosts, Jamie, Alex, and Drac, about how they started Bilge Pumps almost two years ago. I'll have a link in the show notes so you can go over and listen to it. It was a, a lot of fun. There's a lot of laughing involved, uh, and it was a great time. All right, let's go ahead and jump into our first story, but before we do so, if you had done so yet, Take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Story number one takes us to the tanker market and what is going on with ocean tankers. This story by Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7, all eyes on VLCC rates. So the tanker market, like almost all markets, is segregated into different areas. VLCC's very large crude carriers and their bigger cousins, the ultra large crude carriers, do exactly that. They carry the dirty fuel. They carry unrefined oil. And they are of such huge size, we're talking about over 200,000 tons, that very few of them are out there at in service. The more common vessels you see are medium range and long range tankers. These vessels are below 200,000, anywhere from about 80,000 tons up to about 200,000 tons. But now what we're seeing is VLCCs are being fixed. In other words, there are contracts out there to charter them. One of the things we see here in this story is that 10 VLCCs were reportedly fixed on routes, sending freight rates exponentially upwards, both for European directed voyages, but mostly for eastbound voyages into Asia. And if you go down here, you can see a reason why based on this tweet here by Lars Barstead. And what we see here is that tankers are kicking up here because U.S. oil exports are shooting off these huge amounts of cargoes. U.S. exports are the thing of crude oil that is generating this. And to go that distance, to carry crude oil to Distances to refineries, which you want are very large tankers. That's where the VLCCs come in. And so you see this quote right here. Spot fixture volumes in the Arabian Gulf have returned to the pre-pandemic levels during the past two months, while U.S. Gulf fixture activity is approaching record levels. An update uh, pointed out yesterday, something else picked up by the CEO of the tanker giant, giant fr front lines. So what we're seeing here is this massive movement of oil from the United States. This is unrefined crude oil that is heading out. Add to it this story that showed up in Freight Waves, Greg Miller, tanker shipping stocks pull away from the pack, hitting fresh highs. And as always with a Greg Miller story, you get a lot of great information, stats, and of course, some great graphics with this. So he's talking about 52 week highs for Scorpio tankers, SDNG, uh, Ardmore Shipping, AS, ASC, Euronav, EURN, DHT, International Seaways, INSW, and TK Tankers. And when you go down here, look at the year-to-date uh, shipping stock performance by segment using January 1 as your baseline. What you see is tanker stocks are up almost over 80%. Compare that to the other areas, dry bulk, which is just above, and containers, which are ba basically breaking even. Pump down here, product tankers 
uh, Trump crude tankers in 2022, something we knew that was going to happen. Uh, product tankers are the ones that move that clean oil, that clean gasoline, diesel fuel, basically distillates. Using, again, the benchmark of the beginning of the year, you see how product tankers up here in the red are way up over 170%, whereas the crude tankers are just over about 70%. So a really great performance by tankers so far. And then come over here into COVID era shipping stock performance by segment. This takes it all the way back to 2020, the very beginning of 2020. And again, what you see is look at where container stocks were. We knew that big, huge splurge on container stocks. You see dry bulk. But one of the things you're seeing on tankers right there is that kind of really steadfast. You saw a slight little peak here with tankers when all of a sudden everybody stopped driving and you had to stockpile tankers. But what we're seeing is that slight little uptick now coming up. And that's something we've been following with tankers. Uh, it's been low the entire time during COVID except for that one little uptick. And so what we're seeing here is this little peak. Sorry, uh, Peanut is always very concerned about her stock investments. And then right here, COVID era tanker stock performance by segment. Again, you're seeing how the stocks did go back to the 2020 the very beginning, you see how it dips down and then everything is ticking back up. So what does this mean? Well, those that handle the VLCCs, the, that large oil on long distances, again, ton miles, very important measurement to have. It's not how much you carry, but how much you carry by the miles you carry. And what we're seeing right now is those crude carriers because of US production ramping up to cover that production not coming out of Russia is really, influencing the tanker market quite a bit. And so the tanker market is really the one I'm watching right now to see what happens here in the near future. All right, let's go over to story number two. Story number two, our bread and butter containers. What is going on with containers? Holy crud. Keep hearing stories that, you know, hey, in July, we're going to have this off the cliff in freight now it's pushed back to august now august is not is slow but we're still getting record number of containers oh this 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 is everybody trying to guess what is happening what is happening what we can talk about that we know is happening is this report by laurianne larocco on freight waves where she's talking about what's going on and again using these great little heat maps to show where congestion is around the world. So this is the China supply chain right here. And what you're seeing is everything is pretty good in China. The only port that's having a little bit of congestion right now is Yantian. In other words, everybody else is moving, cargo is moving, freight's moving, maybe not at the level we saw last year, but again, last year was a record level. So you gotta be very careful when people sit there and say, well, we're down 30% from last year. Well, last year was the aberration. You got to be looking at historical levels for us. And then you hop over here to Europe and man, Europe is the mess. This is just the mess. Red lights flashing on Europe. Why? A couple of things. We got strikes in Northern Europe, in Germany, and then we have a potential strike looming on the horizon with Felix Stowe, an eight day lockout that's on the verge of happening. And when you look, what are you seeing there in red? You're seeing Bremerhaven and Hamburg, the two German ports right there. The vessels are scheduled in, are behind schedule. Time in port has slowed down and trucks and container availability have all hit the red. Yellow, you're seeing yellow in Felixstowe, in Rotterdam and in Antwerp because of a variety of issues. The only port that's really moving right now is Liverpool that we're seeing. And then finally come over to the United States and it is a mix. Oakland and Savannah, Oakland because of Oakland. I mean, I, I can't talk more about Oakland than I had over the past year and a half. Oakland has historically shot themselves in the foot. They came back very strong, tried to do things, but we've seen what's going on right now is difficulty in getting the ships cycled through the port, which was their historic problem. And we're seeing that build up again. Savannah, everybody punted to Savannah. Savannah wanted to take business. Now understand Savannah's moving. Notice time in port is green. Vessel turnaround is green. The only thing that's going on with Savannah is a long line to get into Savannah. That's what we're seeing. Same thing off of Houston. Uh, not so bad now off New York, New Jersey. They've been able to uh, fix that. And even LA and Long Beach 
what we're seeing is less than two dozen ships waiting to get into LA and Long Beach. Uh, the issue here is the time in port basically to get the cargo off. And that's where you're seeing the yellow right now with Houston, with LA, and with uh, uh, Seattle, Tacoma. Come down here and you start looking at this chart, talking about the number of vessels anchored. And again, when you start looking at it, look at the West Coast, look at the East Coast. East Coast has taken over that. And again, that goes to those two issues we've talked about previously. Number one, congestion at LA and Long Beach has caused a lot of shippers to want to find a diverse route, not put everything into LA and Long Beach. So what have they done? They've put containers on to ships going through the Panama Canal, the big lane of the Panama Canal, that Neo Panamax lane, and others are on those big, huge, ultra large container vessels that are going uh, westward through the Suez Canal to Europe and then transferring from ships from Europe to the United States. And then, of course, the other thing is, is, is that shippers have just diversified where they're going to. They're not just going into L.A. They're still going to L.A. and Long Beach. L.A. and Long Beach still get the biggest portion of cargo, but they're, they're spreading it out. But we've got issues internally in the United States, warehouse congestion, rail congestion. All of that manifests itself. And so where we would expect to see containers coming back into some sort of norm we're not because we keep getting these black swan events you've got strikes in northern europe you've got a potential strike in felix stowe we still have a labor dispute between the ilwu and the pma on the west coast you've got congestion on the east coast nothing is happening i i still think my prediction when it comes to containers is we got to get through this holiday season into the end of this year first quarter of next year before we start seeing really everything coming down. But again, the ocean carriers are in a much better position than they have been in the past. I wanted to share this story from Sam Chambers, again, over at Splash 24-7. Capacity size gap between the largest carriers and the rest of the field now bigger than ever. We are consolidating into those big carriers. Top 10 carriers operate 21.8% million TEU versus 2.5 million TEU for the next 20 ranked lines. And that's a far cry from what it was just a decade ago. Go down here, earnings for medium, small lines typically increased between 100, 700% between 2019, 2021 for the top 10 between 1000 and 6,000 percent. That is an amazing number. That is an amazing number. And when you look at this percentage of share, yeah, Maersk is just a little bit bigger than they were 10 years ago. MSC, yeah, a little bit bigger than they were, but look at how CMA, CGM, Costco, Hophog, Evergreen, ONE, HMM, Yangmin, and Zim have jumped. But more importantly, when you go below the top 10, basically everyone is below 2%. And, you know, some are just a fraction. Go down that list and you start looking at some of these carriers, you know, lines you've heard start coming into LA and Long Beach, SM lines, CU lines, express feeders, barely combined a percent. And this gives you an idea of the power of the big container companies. They will control freight rates. They're going to start canceling sailings. They're going to start scrapping older ships. And they're going to make sure that freight rates do not fall down to that, you know, worldwide index number of 1,500 to 2,000 like they were pre-COVID. They like keeping them between five and 6,000 right now. All right, let's go ahead and jump to story number three. Story number three takes us into the dry bulk market. And one of the things we see here is this story from Greg Miller, the plunge in dry bulk ship shipping, ominous signal on China's economy. Again, we see a very segmented uh, market here when it comes to dry bulkers. Not all bulk ships are the same. And in particularly what uh, Greg is talking about here are the big kind of cape size bulkers. These are the ones known as Panamax, uh, uh, Panamaxes and Supra Panamaxes. So these are vessels anywhere from about 45,000 tons up to about 90,000 tons. And what we're seeing here is just like container rates have fallen, we're seeing this in the dry bulk. Uh, as you see right here, spot rates have nosedive and bulk owners have far more exposed to spot pricing than container lines. 
dry bulk congestion has cleared, released significant capacity into the market. You may remember earlier this year, there was a huge log jam off of China due to COVID lockdowns and they couldn't move out a lot of bulk material. Well, now the dry bulkers are moving again, but what we're seeing is they're back in the red by uh, right now. And it appears that China is the big culprit about it. Uh, it goes down here in the story in October, average Cape size rates topped $80,000 per day with some vessels getting as much as $100,000 per day. As of Tuesday, the Baltic Cape size index assessed rates at just $8,783 per day that is a tenth of what they were making and that obviously has huge impact go on here uh talking about a, a quote from breakwaves advisors freight futures especially ones maturing beyond next month are purely driven by expectations earlier this year memories of last year's one hundred thousand dollar day rates increase hopes of a repeat driving futures to unexplained frothy levels that have now retracted back to reality now of course this can all change. If China again resumes their movement, we'll see that. But if you go down here to this chart, you'll see what Greg has done. And again, I always love these Greg Miller stories because he has great data here. But you'll see the Cape size spot earnings right here with the five-year high lows in there. You see 2021 being on the very extreme right there and how 2022 is actually for Cape size falling out of the five-year average with the Panamax about smack dab right where it is and the Supermax being basically on the, a little bit on the lower side. But what we're seeing here is dry bulk stocks, which are really reacting toward the market more than anything else right now. But you'll see dry bulk stocks since the beginning of the year have just fallen with a lot of uh, major players here showing that loss. And if you look across, you can see uh, uh, Grindad with, with really that biggest uh, loss, right? Excuse me, uh, uh, Genko shipping and trading with the biggest loss there at 38%, followed by Eagle, followed by Golden Ocean, then by uh, 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 Grindad, and all the way back up through the rest, uh, start stopping there at Starbulk. And we're seeing that. Now, remember, what we're talking about here with these bulkers is the shipments of ore. We are, of course, seeing shipment of grain do something a lot different. Story in G-Captain uh, about the fact that we're seeing the biggest convoy of ships getting ready, set to load right now out of Ukraine. However, as I mentioned in a previous video, got to be careful about this because even though the Ukraine is expecting to load about five ships, they are fairly on the small side. Almost all these ships are really, really small. Again, that goes to insurance and it goes to the expectation of when or not these ships are going to be able to get out into the marketplace. They're not going to risk big bulk vessels in Ukraine yet. Yeah, you've seen them come out because they're trying to get out, but you really haven't seen them go in. And that's a lot because of the fact that there's only about $50 million worth of war risk insurance out there. And so if your vessel is worth more than that, and you're not willing to take that chance, then you're more likely not going to put a bigger vessel into a war zone. Really interesting watching the bulk sector right now. All right, let's go ahead, head over to story number four, passenger liners. So don't usually talk too much about the passenger liner industry because there's some great channels out there that cover it. However, I like to cover the business of passenger liners. So this story popped the other day. Norwegian Cruise Line says pre-pandemic pre occupancy still a year away as their shares tumble. Add this story to it. Cruise uh, Line's cruise shortages lead to canceled trips. That's a Bloomberg story. Both these stories are off of G Captain. Talking about how Carnival this week canceled 11 fall sailings on its Diamond Princess, saying it couldn't provide the level of service customers expect amid ongoing labor shortages. So let me just say a couple of things. Number one, the cruise industry woefully miscalculated on the scope and scale of the pandemic. And what they wound up doing was keeping crews on vessels once everything shut down. And that involved a huge, massive cross-decking of personnel to sail them back to their ports, get the crews off. But most importantly of all, there is no place to park these vessels. 
And so they wound up having to sail and steam these vessels for the entire pandemic with nobody on board but the operating crew. These ships did not have places to dock. They didn't go cold layup, which they should have done. At the very least, most of the big cruise lines should have cold laid up a large portion of their fleet because it was going to take a while to get things back up and running. But they didn't do that. They kept these ships hot, running. And when you have a ship that's up and running, you got to run it out to sea every few days to do uh, issues with pumping uh, 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 waste off because you treat the waste and either you're going to pump it ashore or you have to pump it off when you're out at sea. Now, it gets treated. You don't go pump poor, uh, raw stuff in the ocean, although sometimes they will do that. But I mean, what this necessitated where these ships were just huge money sucking holes in the water because there was no passengers at all. And I would argue that the cruise lines even now have misjudged starting up too soon, too many times, uh, going on very long cruises, which just makes an outbreak of COVID more likely to happen. And that is reflective in their stocks. When you look at the stocks, this is Royal Caribbean stock. Let's go to their five-year. You got, can, can you see on this chart where COVID started? I think it's pretty good, pretty easy to see where it started. Uh, they were up at over $133, $135 a share. And then it bottomed out, bottomed out to almost $23. And now you see it bottoming out again. But if you look at their chart for, for basically since the beginning, stocks were pretty good for cruise lines. And the cruise lines only perceived they were going to get bigger. They only did. If you look at their reports, if you look at their advocacy group, CLIA, uh, the Cruise Line Inter International Association. I mean, all they ever talked about was new ships, new more, more passengers, new markets. Never saw this going bad. This is Carnival right here. Again, look at the five-year. You can see where it fell off the cliff. Started ticking back up as you know the vaccine came on and cruising started. But what you've seen here is a slow progression downward. But again, when you look at their overall track record, uh, a pretty solid basis. And then Norwegian follows that same track line. I mean, they're, they're all kind of right on top of each other, off the cliff, slowly inch back up, and then the fall back off. And again, if you look at them over the long term here, uh, you can see that. I, I would make the argument about the cruise lines is this. 2013, Costa Concordia went aground off of Giglio in off the coast of Italy completely the fault of the master, criminal negligence by the master, killed 33, 32 people on board, 32 people killed on board. Let me be clear, hundreds, if not thousands, could have died on that vessel if the wind had been blowing offshore instead of onshore. If that vessel had not blown ashore on the Giglio and rolled on its side there, you would have had hundreds, if not thousands, killed. You saw a dip in the stock in the shipping stock and shipping and cruise line itineraries bookings for six months and then people forgot it and off they went same's going to happen again with cruise ships when it comes to this the problem right now is the cruise lines have mismanaged themselves and put themselves in just huge holes of debt that they're trying to climb out of it and they assumed their, their assets, the ships, would be enough to get them through that. However, one of the things we've seen is, is they just absolutely, in my opinion, misjudged this. I was talking about this, and it's not that I'm a genius by any means. It's just it didn't make sense for me for them to keep entire fleets of vessels up and running because everybody knew you were going to kind of you know get back into cruising slowly in steps gradually you weren't just going to flip a switch and all of a sudden go back to cruising the way it was and that's where the cruise lines made a a fundamental mistake all right let's go get ready for this bonus story what's that you say sal a bonus story yes we're not doing the typical five stories in what the ship we're doing six and we're doing six because there's another sector of the maritime industry we don't get a chance to talk about too much doesn't make the news all the time, but the roll on, roll off sector. And this sector is another one that is seeing a big tick up. This story by Mike Schuller over at G Captain, Willenius Wilhelmsen, Wilhelmsen, I, I, my German is not what it used to be, 
see strong demand for Roro shipping. So Roro carriers are car carriers, truck carriers. They are basically huge floating car decks where we usually talk about car carriers on what's going on with shipping is usually they're on fire. Uh, but in this case, what we're talking about is the demand for roll-on, roll-off shipping. Uh, this company, uh, Willinius, operates about 130 vessels across 16 routes across six continents, and they are reporting a huge uptick. Their uh, quarter two EBITDA, 311 million, up 1% compared to quarter one. But one of the things we're seeing is that demand for vehicles is out there. We saw how used cars ticked up tremendously, but now what we're seeing here is this real big demand for vehicles out here. So the roll-on, roll-off industry is definitely one that we're seeing picked up. The other thing to make note of here is that the U.S. military, which is trying to recapitalize its roll-on, roll-off fleet, what is known as the sea lift fleet, has decided to, to do so right at the worst time possible. Buying old used roll-on, roll-off ships when the market is at it, the highest it's ever been is not a great time to try to recapitalize oneself. But we're definitely seeing the different sectors of the maritime industry reacting differently at this immediate time. Containers, dry bulk, tankers, passenger liners, and roll-off, roll-on, roll-off ships. All of them are reacting differently. And it's really important to watch this if you're interested in this sector, if you use this sector for your shipping, if you're a consumer, if you're an investor, you have to follow along with the news about what is going on and understand too that within each sector, there are subsets. And this is what makes shipping so unique in my opinion and why it's such a great story and great industry to watch. All right, let's go to our last story of the day, which has an impact on global shipping. Our final story takes us to climate. Now, a lot of people will get up in arms about climate change, global warming, global cooling, whatever you want to call it. I'm a historian. One of the things I can tell you without a doubt is the earth goes through cycles of heating and cooling. That's true from the historical records. We've seen many ice ages, we've seen heat waves, we've seen droughts. This happens all the time. And I think one of the things that we get so wrapped up with is we think that humans are causing whatever's happening right now. But I, I would argue that one of the things to be thinking about is that we could be in one of these cycles right now, but humans can be accelerating it. And I think that's the important thing. Regardless of, of what you believe, what we do know is that we're seeing the impact of some of this climate on global shipping. This story from Bloomberg that's on G Captain, veteran barge company warns Upper Rhine River shipping at risk. Uh, this image here showing people walking in what is the Rhine River uh, from the banks is definitely demonstrating to us the Upper Rhine, which is actually the southern part of the Rhine, is seeing this huge drop in water. Uh, roughly 150 tanker barges of the Jaeger group on the river, now more than 10% would be able to carry goods through the key water waypoint of Cobb with a water uh, mark at 30 centimeters, 11.8 inches. Currently, the figure at that point of the river is 32 centimeters. A further drop below the 20 centimeter line could knock out the company's operations going through that port completely. Understand that Europe depends immensely on river and barge trade. For example, you can go from Rotterdam all the way to uh, Budapest down into the Black Sea via the Rhine Main Danube Canal. And a lot of canals cut into the interior of Europe. They use this because they have huge costs in taxes on diesel fuel, on trucks, on highways. And so uh, the, the barge traffic is essential. Yet what we're seeing is lower water levels on the rivers, which means that not only the Rhine, but the Elbe, the Vistula, uh, the, uh, the Loire, the Seine, you name it, all these major rivers are being impacted by this lack of water, these high heat, which is means that, you know, in the wintertime, you're not getting that, that uh, snow cap on the Alps like you usually do, and it's not melting in the springtime. And it's not just in Europe. This story on Maritime Executive, Yanks, uh, China's Yangtze River also reports falling water threatening shipping. Uh, 
And again, the Yangtze is one of the main tributaries. It is the Mississippi River on steroids when it comes to China. It is one of the key things that hooks into the Grand Canal and the entire coastal region of China. We're seeing it in the United States and the Colorado River, where the Colorado River is not a navigable river. We're not moving cargo up and down, but it provides water for towns, cities, irrigation, businesses. And we're seeing that the, the Great Salt Lake is just a salt lake. It's not great anymore. It, it, it's shrinking up. And this issue on water levels is really important because as those water levels fall in the inland waterways, it creates disruptions. It creates disruptions that mean you can't move goods from the interior to the exterior, exterior to the interior. Uh, it, it's got a whole batch of ramifications in, on, in the Atlantic, for example, as you melt the, the polar ice cap, you push cold water into the Atlantic, you push the Gulf Stream south, and that cools off Europe. Europe is, stays temperate because of the Gulf Stream. Europe is really high north. No one ever realizes that like London is above Montreal and Quebec in terms of its latitude. But this impacts everything. And what we're seeing right now are these water levels changing the ability to get ships in and out. All right. Six stories instead of five this week. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got a good update on what's going on with shipping. I'll, of course, have the links to all those stories and more in the show notes so you can delve into them if you have a particular area or sector you want to go into. I'm going to be doing some little bit of feature stories on these little individual areas on as stories uh, make uh, their mark. Did a couple of stories this week out there, one on Jeff Bezos uh, scrapping his mother, which was a, a, a funny story about him and his space co company. But again, take a look at some videos we've posted. And more importantly, if you enjoyed today's episode, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell. So be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up. And if you can, if you can, contribute to the page. You can do that one of two ways. One, you can hit that super thanks button below and contribute directly to the page. This allows me the time and the effort to put this channel together to bring you news. And then the other way is to head on over to Patreon. Our link to Patreon is right here at the end of the video. Go to Patreon, become a patron of the page. You have different levels of subscriptions and assistance you can provide to the page. I appreciate all my patrons. They allow me to do this. They keep me going. And it demonstrates for me the interest they have in the channel. Until our next video, this is Sal saying aloha.